Hi folks, hope you're okay today. It's good to be with you. My website is jasonburnspreacher.com uh, I just want to talk just a little bit about how to defend the faith concerning the Trinity, uh, especially when you're down at Hyde Park. Uh, I want to show you this article. It's called The Quran and the Holy Trinity is Islam's Mistaken View of Basic Christian Doctrines, Sam Shamol. The Quran and the Holy Trinity, Islam's Mistaken Views of Basic Christian Doctrines, Sam Shamol. And there, there's the article there. Uh, and it's very, very helpful. Um, and basically, uh, the Quran teaches that, that um, the Trinity is Father Mary and uh, Son. So when you're in a debate with Muslims, you need to bring that out. You need to bring out the fact that the Quran is mistaken concerning the doctrine of the Trinity, doesn't understand the doctrine of the Trinity. And that article is very helpful. And there's another article um, which uh, looks at uh, Matthew, it, it's um, by Sam Shimon, a series of answers to common questions. Uh, Sam Simone and it looks at Matthew 28 19 where it talks about going the name of the Father, Son and the Holy Spirit and it looks at the manuscript evidence concerning that. Uh, when you look at ancient manuscripts we only have snippets of the Gospel of Matthew up till about the 4th century so we don't have a full Gospel of Matthew till, till late on. Um, then we have the last ending of, of Matthew within it but the snippets that we have, like chapter 3 and other bits of Matthew uh, from the 2nd and 3rd century, uh, we don't have anything of the last ending of Matthew till about the th late 3rd or 4th century. Uh, there, there are manuscripts that we have debated, uh, and people that scholars have said it are early, but some scholars have said it the later. The point is, is that when you quote in Matthew, uh, at the end of Matthew it says, go in the name of the Father, Son and the Holy Spirit. Just remember that the Muslims might bring that argument up. And if they do, uh, it doesn't weaken the argument. We do have manuscripts with uh, that passage in. But anyhow, the article there, um, a series of answers to common questions, Sam Simon, Shimon. You can get these articles, uh, the Quran and the Holy Trinity by Sam Shimon at, um, you can get them at, uh, Answering Islam, and you can get a series of answers to common questions by Sam Shimon at Answering Islam, and they're very helpful. So, some debate tips concerning uh, debating at high part when you're debating Muslims about the Trinity. Um, if you go out and look at my video, um, uh, the video is um, Jason uh, Jose vs Jason did God become a baby uh, if you look at that video uh, that's specifically on the Trinity and look how I deal with uh, the Muslim there and then there's another debate by a friend of mine called Mike he debated uh, a guy called Muhammad and look at the debate there and uh, we approach it in a little bit different but then we use some similar tactics in, in, in debating Muslims. Um, a couple of debate tactics that are very effective is when a Muslim brings up about the Trinity and that God can change, then turn it back on the Muslim and say, well, your God can change because your God has supposedly given us a revelation, i.e. the Torah and the Injil, and now you're saying they're corrupted. Now the Muslims will try and wiggle out of that and they'll try and say, oh well God didn't give the Injil, the Injil's not a book. So you need to make sure that you've got some Quranic verses that you can quote to show that the Injil is a book and the Torah is a book. And then once you've got those verses, bring it home again and say, look, you brought, you saying that your our God changes. We, we don't agree with that, but Yours is a schizophrenic God. Your Quran 
says that we have a revelation from God and, it's been, and then you're saying it's been corrupted so your God changes. And you need to stick to that and you need to hold them to that because what that'll do is that'll stop them from critiquing you then. They've got to deal with that issue. Um, now they'll try and wiggle out of it. They'll try and say the Quran doesn't say this and say that. Well, that's okay. Bring out your Quranic verses. Show them that it does. And let them try and refute you. But what it's doing is it's taking their attention now away from the Trinity. And now they're going on the defensive rather than on the attack. So that's what you need to do. You need to go on the attack and critique the Quran and say the Quran's contradictory because it says this and they'll say no no let's go back to the trinity and you say wait wait a minute you're looking at this from an islamic point of view and i don't agree with your islamic point of view your source is not the bible it's coming from the quran so we need to look at your quran and see whether it's a good source for theological reflection your way of interpreting the bible is from the quran so we need to look, never mind about the Trinity, we need to look at the method that you're interpreting from, which is the Quran. And your Quran contradicts itself because it says our book has not changed. That, so, that, sorry, our, 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 our book is, is from, from God and our books are from God and your God doesn't change and he's given a revelation, it doesn't change. And now you're saying, you, you seem to be either going against the Quran or you seem to be contradicting yourself and your God seems to be contradicting because you're saying the Bible's been corrupted and that it can change. And, you know, it doesn't make sense. If, if the Bible can be corrupted, it means that your God has changed. It means that your God isn't the true God. So that's a debate tactic that you can use at Hyde Park, but it's also a debate tactic, discussion tactic that you can use um, and it's a very effective method. I used it on a guy called Hussein. If you go and watch it, how I used it on him, he didn't really know how to respond. I've used it on a few people at Hyde Park. There was one young guy who was a bit of a scholar who wiggled his way out of it. He tried to wiggle his way out of it. So you're going to get some people who try to wiggle their way out of that argument. So what you need to do is have in your back pocket a list of Quranic verses and have a bit of Arabic underneath and a few word studies just in case and bring it out and then once you've got them on this issue of what the Quran says about the Bible and that it cannot change and that they've said it has changed and cor been corrupted then you've got them by the throat you just tell them that God their God changes so their God can't be the real God because that's going to be their argument against you about the Trinity that God can change that's one of their main arguments that God changes that one minute he's uh, in heaven next minute he's a baby okay so, so you need to hold, you, you need to push them back, and that's one way of pushing them back. Now, the second thing is you need to do is you need to, you need to uh, make sure that you uh, hold them to the fire about the ground rules. What they'll do is they'll quote a scripture like, my father is greater than I, or something. And then they'll say, oh, you know, the Bible doesn't see, teach Trinity. You, you need to hold them to the fire and say, wait a minute. If I quote a verse from the Quran and say the Quran teaches jihad from one verse or two verses, you'd be really upset because you'd say, look, there's loads of verses here that you need to look in context. If we're going to look at the Trinity, we have to look at a lot of verses and we have to look at them in context. So you can't just use one text and say, end of debate, done. You need to bring that in straight away, if you're at Hyde Park, and ram it home and make it clear to him or her, and make it clear to anybody who's listening. And if you're talking to someone on the streets and you're doing evangelism, you need to, uh, you need to bring that about to tell them, Look, you want me to give you these snap answers, then you know you need to think again, because this this needs uh, studying in, in a wider context of the Bible. Thirdly, um, you can also use examples from the Quran. The Quran says that Jesus is the Word of God, so you can say, well, if Jesus is the Word of God, uh, you believe God's words eternal. Most Muslims do, not all, but most. So if God's words eternal. 
And if Jesus is the word of God, Jesus was eternal, which really gives you God. So Jesus is God from your Quran. Um, so you can use the Quran to show that Jesus is God. Um, I think that uh, a good reason why to share why, about the Trinity is that God is relational, that God wants a relationship with us. Uh, and to bring this home in your discussion, uh, the difference between the Islamic God and the Christian God, that we, we have a God who wants a relationship with us and the Trinity reveals that relationship. Um, so talk about God is relational and he comes down and he comes near and uh, he comes to redeem us, he comes to save us. Whereas your God is up there, our God is down here and he comes to us. He's a great God but he comes to us. So try and talk about God is a relational God and, and to bring in the gospel. Um, on the logical arguments, uh, they'll bring up logical arguments and examples where they'll say, well, uh, is God weak? And you say, no. Well, how can God be born as a baby? That's weakness. So you've got to try and help them understand, like, well, you know, God um, uses the weak things of the world to confound the mighty. That's not weakness, that's strength. That you, you can reveal yourself in humble ways. Um, doesn't make you weak in the sense that you're talking about. Um, so they'll use arguments like that where they'll say, uh, well, can God go to the toilet? And can God do this? Can, can God cry? And what you what what the Muslims are trying to do is they're trying to frame the debate and discussion on what they think the Trinity is or what the deity of Christ is, and you've got to keep reminding them and saying, no, you're you're straw manning the Christian position. That is not the Christian position. The Christian position is two natures in one person, and you've got to keep stressing that. You're saying no, you you're, you're being you're making a logical deduction, and this is a mystery. There is a mystery to this. And you need to stress that. And they're making a logical deduction based on the fact that they think they know the nature of complete nature of God and they don't. We say that Jesus is two, uh, two natures in one person. We define that person generally, but we don't we, we, we can't say that the flesh, the flesh of Jesus is God. That's not true. The flesh is the flesh, the flesh is man. The spirit is God, and, the, and so two natures, the spirit and the flesh, came together and became one. But, but how, what, what that means fully as in one, you know, we have to be very careful not to overstep what scripture says. It says that, that in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word was God. And then in verse 14, and the word became flesh. And the word became, let's just get that, verse 14. So, so we don't, we don't. Uh, John chapter 1 verse 14. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld the glory uh, of the only begotten of the Father full of grace and truth. But when he says and the word was made flesh it's not saying there that the actual flesh the actual flesh is God it's saying that the the word became flesh it, it dwelt in flesh tabernacled in flesh like the glory of God tabernacled in the temple so the glory of God tabernacles in Christ so he's two natures in one person so what they do is they'll try and straw man the argument and make logical implications and you've got to say, well, there's a mystery here, there's a mystery to this two natures in one person and you're going beyond the mystery. And they'll say, well, you know, no, it's logical. And you say, well, you're going, to, you're going beyond the mystery. 
I think it's important to stress that. There's nothing wrong in believing in mystery. There's mystery in all knowledge. We, there is a boundary of the unknowable, even in knowledge, uh, just general knowledge, how much more with God. God is infinite, we are finite, we cannot fully comprehend Him. And then logical arguments, uh, they'll say, well, you have one plus one plus one is three. But if you have one divided by one, divided by one, you have one. You've got three ones there, but it's still one. So they can go one plus one plus one is three. You can go one divided by one divided by one is one. Okay? So, um, so, you know, numbers game doesn't prove anything. You can do whatever with numbers. Um, philosophers have discussed throughout history uh, the one and the many. Nature has, is one, yet there are many parts to nature. And philosophers for thousands of years have discussed this. And the Trinity solves that philosophical problem. Why is there one and the many? Because in the nature of God there is one and there are many. There are three parts. And so reality mirrors the image of God. Um, so if you want to talk about logic, you can go into the philosophy of one and the many. And say, how, do, how does believing in one God, as the Muslims do, answer the philosophical question of why there is one and the many? The second argument that you can make is an argument which I think uh, Sir Thomas Aquinas uses, which I call the argument of differentiation. And that is, is similar to the one and the many, that within reality, uh, there are essences, and in those essences, there are differences. So, for example, uh, if you take my watch, it's one watch, but there are parts to the watch. There are differences within the watch. There's uh, a glass cover, there is a, a strap. It's one, but there are parts to that one. And so any essence of reality, you'll find that there are parts, there is one essence and there are parts. So that's another argument that you can use. And then there are other arguments. You can use uh, the social argument, uh, the power argument, and the epistemological argument, and the relational argument. These are other arguments that you can use in defense of the Trinity. The social argument um, that uh, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, that we are made in the image of God. Why is it that men and women marry and, and why is it we have families? It's because the very nature of God is a family. If God is one, it doesn't explain that reality of why we have families and why we have relationships. The very nature of God is relational. Is family orientated in the Trinity, whereas as, as the God is, who is one, as the Muslims say, that is just isolated. Um, so it doesn't explain why there are families. It doesn't explain why why we are relational beings. Then epistemologically, uh, the very nature of God in the Trinity implies. Uh, that we can know this God but if you take the Islamic God that God is nothing like us that he's out there and he's nothing like us then how can we get to know this God and if this God communicates then that's a direct contradiction you're saying this is a God that is nothing like us but communicates i.e. gives a revelation of the Quran then that's a contradiction because communication is an aspect of of, of being human. So it can't be, as the Muslims say, that God is nothing like us. I've heard Muslims talk about communicable, communicable and incommunicable attributes of God, but quite, quite 
honestly, they're borrowing from Christian theology rather than Islamic theology when they're doing that, because Muslims generally believe that God is nothing like us. So when they're using arguments about communicable and incommunicable attributes of God, uh, they're contradicting themselves there, and I think they're borrowing from Christian theology. Uh, but the point is, is that Muslims, many Muslims believe that God is nothing like us, yet we believe in a Trinitarian God who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and therefore, because he's relational, he communicates. And this communication, he helps us to understand who he is. And that is the basis of epistemology of how we know what we know, that God communicates to us, gives us revelation of himself. And only a Trinitarian understanding of God helps us to understand epistemologically a theory of knowledge of why we can get to know God and have a relationship with God. So there's the social argument and the, uh, there is the epistemological argument. Um, th there's a couple of other arguments as well. So, so when you're talking to a Muslim, um, make sure that you have some of these articles, make sure you've checked a little bit of church history. Um, if the Muslims say that the Trinity was invented politically, all you have to remind them, you'd say, is, well, Islam was invented politically. You have the Shia and the Sunni issue and the arguments between the Shia and the Sunni. And so Islam was rooted and born in a political uh, shenanigans going on. So you can't throw that level, that accusation against Christianity and the formation of the Trinity. It just doesn't work. And the fact of the matter is, is that the quotations of the early church fathers uh, shows you that there was already a trinity uh, in its simplest form there in the early church and that was nothing to do with politics. Uh, so I hope this information has been helpful. Uh, I hope it gives you some ideas about how to discuss and debate uh, with Muslims. Um, so let's pray. Father we thank you for this day. And Lord, these four videos, I just hope it, it gives people a bit of way forward and how to debate Muslims, how to share the gospel with Muslims and how people can uh, speak to Muslims at Hyde Park and, and in life generally. And I just pray that these videos will be a help to people in Jesus' name and, and for your glory, Lord. Amen. hope these videos have been a help. I've just given you a bit of research a bit of my own thinking and I just hope that it's been a help. If it just spurs you on to go and study these articles and to think about these things more, go and listen to David Wood on the Trinity, Sam Shimon on the Trinity, um, James White on the Trinity, uh, these resources will really help you. So thank you for listening. If you want to read a book on the Trinity, uh, St. Augustine's book on the Trinity is a really good read. So thank you for listening and God bless you.